microphone to my level after he spoke. I look up to him in more ways than you know. I want to start by saying thank you to the congregation here. Thank you all for inviting us, for allowing my family and me to be able to be here with you during this week. Thank you to the elders for your warm welcome, your hospitable invitation. We're so grateful to be in your very presence. I want to say thank you for being who you are. And what I mean by that is, you know, preachers get together and they talk. And they always say, well, how's the work going? And before long, you know which preachers not to ask, how's the work going? Because, oh, you, 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 they just have right. I asked Terrence, how's the work going? Brother, it's going well. He has wonderful things to say about the congregation here now. Brethren, I'm here to tell you that's not always the case. There are times when the brethren don't have very many good things to say about the preacher. And there are times when the preacher that really has a struggle to find good things to say about the brethren of the congregation. The same can be said for the elders sometimes too, please understand. That's not the case here. And that's a wonderful thing. I pray that you appreciate the relationship that, that you currently have after only one year. And I pray that the Lord will bless you all with many more years to come and working together, glorifying Christ and reaching the lost in this community. We, uh, as Terrence mentioned, we were able to uh, meet in a couple of different lecture series in the past. And there are some folks that when you meet them, you just click. And that's kind of the way it was with the Dindies. We had invited them to come to DeGaul Drive. They were going to be staying with us. And my wife was getting ready. She had told one of the other ladies that was visiting with the congregation, she said, yeah, I've got to go home. I've got to make sure I clean the house well because, you know, we've never stayed with the Dindies before. We're not sure what to expect. We want to make sure everything's just right. This sister looked at Melissa and said, listen, they are real people. <laughs> what she meant by that is you don't have to put on any airs with them. Well, they are real people. Then, a little over a year later, we had the privilege of having Cavantre and Gabriel stay with us while Terrence and Sheena were in Jamaica. And my wife and I like to employ sarcasm sometimes when disciplining. And at one point, I think my wife had said something to one of our children along the lines of, well, if you're going to whine to hear yourself, just go upstairs so nobody else has to hear it. It was Gabriel that said, you know, we were nervous coming over here. We, we thought y'all were decent, but y'all are just like us. <laughs> That's a wonderful thing, brethren. It really is. I love like-minded people. And for Christians, when we get right down to it, Christians, we ought to be like-minded, right? Amen. Paul said... Let there be no divisions among them. Be perfectly joined together. The same mind, the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1.10. He told the Philippians, walk by the same rule. Mind the same thing. Philippians 3.17. Philippians 2.2. 2, he said, fulfill my joy. Be like-minded. Have the same love. Be of one accord, of one mind. Christians can think alike. Now the world around us is going to tell us something else. The world around us is going to tell us that based upon our complexion, our culture, our background, we're going to think differently, see things differently, and we cannot see eye to eye. The Bible tells me if I'm a Christian, I can be like-minded. The way that I look at the world is not based upon what the world sees, but where I'm looking. It's not a matter of how I look, but whether I'm looking at Jesus. It's not a matter of where I've been, but if I'm going toward Christ. I love being around like-minded people because that means they're in the book. At least I hope that's what they mean. Because if I'm around like-minded people and they're not in the book, that's not a good reflection on me. Now, granted, there are areas where we don't have to be like-minded. I, I feel so sorry for Terrence and Sheena. They're Oklahoma football fans. I fear we'll try to convert them eventually, but they've been that way for a long time. Now. I'm a Tennessee Vols fan, and I tell folks I bleed orange, and we've been bleeding a lot here lately. <laughs> but you know, in the areas where it doesn't matter, well, it doesn't matter. And, and if we want to be honest with each other, I know there are times when we weep over losses, but when we're talking about things like sports or those material things that don't matter, they don't matter. We don't have to see eye to eye. That's right. When it comes to the things that matter, yes, sir. brethren, it matters. Now, I want you to think about what Paul wrote. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, he said, 
These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. Yes, yes. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Paul emphasized how important the church is to God by calling it the house of God. We not say the household of God. Let's just go ahead and make it simple. The family of God. God, it has been said, has given man three institutions for man's well-being. God instituted the home, the family, Genesis 2.24. Therefore, man shall leave father and mother and leave him to his wife. The twain shall be one flesh. God instituted the home for man's domestic well-being. God instituted government, Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God instituted government for our civil well-being. Yes, and then there's the church. All right. Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. And the Lord has instituted the church for man's eternal well-being. Yes, now, with that thought in mind, Consider again what Paul said when he wrote to Timothy. He said, you need to know how to behave, conduct yourself in the house family of God, which is the church of the living God. D do you see two institutions mentioned in the same verse? Family and the church. There's a link. If I'm going to appreciate the way my God looks at his church, I need to have an appreciation for what family is. There's a connection there. Yes, now, we'll look further later today about even more emphasize that family connection when we look at how Paul said, Husband, love your, wife, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. It's not just a family connection. It's a bride and groom connection. Yes, that being said, God looks at the church as family, his family. If you will, turn to Psalm 127. Yes, Psalm 127 Beginning in verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman watching, but in vain. Now, consider the implication here. Except the Lord build the house. House. That's the home. That's the family. That, that's the domestic unit. Except they build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. Oh, multiple houses. Multiple Homes, multiple domestic units. We have the home connected to society. question. Or if you look at the very end of Psalm 128, the last two verses, verses 5 and 6, the Lord blessed thee out of Zion, a city, a part of Jerusalem actually. Thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. City, city. Thou shalt see thy children's children. Now that's family. And I've talked to some grandparents. That's their favorite family, their children's children. We were talking with our vet just earlier this week, and he said, I've already told my daughters that if I could have just had grandchildren and I had put up with them, I would have done it. <laughs> children's children, that's family. They're special, right? Amen. City, Zion. City, Jerusalem. Family. Thou shalt see thy children's children in peace upon Israel. Israel, the nation. As goes the home, so goes the nation. I want to thank the men who have been participating in this worship service. The ones that have led us in congregational prayers, both have prayed for the nation. And you've prayed for the nation in such a way that I couldn't tell you how you voted. That's not always the case, folks. You, you pray for the leaders no matter what. God bless you for that. Amen. That's it. God bless you for that. Amen. We need to understand what we're to pray for the nation. Paul said that first Timothy chapter 2. The scripture shows us not only the link between the home, family, and the church, there's a link between the home and government. As goes the home, so goes the nation. If I do not appreciate God's concept of the family, the home, I'll never really appreciate the church the way he does. Amen. And if I do not appreciate God's concept of the home, the family, I will not influence society or government around me the way that I want. Amen. Friends, we're going to talk about family this week. Amen. 
We're in Psalm 127 and 128. Let's examine these psalms. Now, these two psalms appear right in the middle of what are called the psalms of degrees. The psalms of degrees, the psalms of ascents, are a, a, a series of psalms from Psalm 120 to 134 that were sung by the travelers, the pilgrims, if you will, traveling from their dwelling places to Jerusalem three times a year for those annual feasts, the Feast of Passover, Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles. And if you read those psalms from that idea, you get a picture painted for you of the things they're seeing. They'll talk about the mountains and the hills. They'll think about the things on which they're thinking, uh, the blessings that they've had back at home. Right. They'll talk about where they're going. And, and here, right in the middle of it, they talk about family. All right. Now, here are what, what was essentially a majority of men traveling because it was not required for the ladies to make this journey every time, but it was required for the men. Right. And oftentimes the women would stay at home just to, uh, well, take care of the home front, if you will. But here are uh, what is uh, mainly a bunch of men traveling, and they're not singing Bob Dylan songs. <laughs> they're not singing Bob Seeger songs. They're not even singing Bob Barley songs. They are singing songs about the family. They're not singing songs about how I just can't understand my wife. Well, or it's good to be out on the road again. Uh, <laughs> okay, we throw Willie Nelson in there. <laughs> They're singing about the beauty of family. As they prepare themselves to, where are they going? Jerusalem. For what purpose? Worship. Now, with that idea, let's read Psalm 127, 128. Except the Lord build the house. Sorry, brother labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman watch it, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, eat the bread of sorrows. So he give his beloved sleep. Mm -hmm. Oh, children are a heritage of the Lord. Right. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Right. As arrows in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of they shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Yes, Chapter 128. Sorry. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. <laughs> thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. Happy shalt thou be. Sorry. And it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as the fruitful vine by the sides of thy house. Thy children like olive trees round about thy table. Behold, thus shall a man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Thou shalt see thy children's children in peace upon Israel. Have you ever looked through these old albums? I know we don't have them that often anymore because we have these, you know, pocket brains. We pull out our iOS device and we look back through them. But once upon a time, there was something sitting on the coffee table called a family photo album. Yes, sir. All the memories that you can find in those. You open that album and you're reminded of past events like uh, vacations and births. You're reminded of past accomplishments like weddings and graduations. You're reminded of past mistakes like hairstyles and clothing. <laughs> I've seen some of those. I don't know how women in the late 80s ever got through a door with their veins standing at them. And I don't know how some men in the late 70s got through a door with their hair looking the way it did. And yeah, there you go. We have fun with those things, right? You ever ask someone, hey, where was, where was Tina in this picture? Where was your wife when this picture was taken? Or, or where, was, where, where was Mark in this picture? And the answer comes back, well, he was taking the picture. Or she was holding the camera. Have you ever stopped and wondered, where was God in this picture? You know that picture you see when he's holding a beer and a cigarette? Where was God in that picture? Or it was a Sunday morning, and he got his first holy one at 10.30 a.m. There's a picture by the flag on the fourth green. God in that picture. Here this morning, God bless you for it. Whatever age you may be, perhaps you're an aged soul with many years to your rudder. 
God was there throughout your life because the Apostle Paul tells us he's not very far from every one of us. Acts 17. God was there, but did you let God be in the picture? Maybe you're, you're younger like me. I like to tell myself I'm young, just not like your dad. Like that. Maybe you're younger, even much younger than me, really starting out, perhaps not even married yet or, or early in life. If the tomorrows continue to come, you expect many years ahead. Or you hope for that, and you have a reasonable hope for that. God's going to be there. Will you let him be picture? We've got a new term that we use in today's vernacular. You're taking a picture of a group of people, and someone else pops his head in there. What's it called? Photobomb. My children love it when they can find pictures of dogs that, that, that just put their heads in the picture of the family. The dog, photobomb the picture. The cat, photobomb the picture. They just sit and laugh. Does God have to photobomb your picture? There's he going to be in there. Now, looking at Psalm 127 and 128, we're going to see a progression. Over what you might call the stages of the home and the stages of the family, let's ask ourselves, is God in the picture? Am I going to let him be in the picture? As I look through the portrait of time at my family, is God in the picture? We're looking at the ideas of fulfilling a godly life. Now the blessings that are described are not guaranteed. Tragedies and travesties occur. But what we see is a general description of a godly life. Problems are inevitable. But the problems are not going to eclipse the joy that is in God if God is truly in the picture. Perhaps you're aged and never married, or perhaps tragedy struck at a much earlier age than you ever would have wanted to see a departure occur. There are so many things that can alter a family dynamic that are beyond our control, and there are things that can alter my family dynamic that I should have had more control over earlier, but God wasn't in the picture. Whatever the case, Wherever you are right now, we're asking about tomorrow. Sorry, but Whatever your tomorrow may be, we're asking about this afternoon. Amen. Will God be in the picture? In every stage of the home is God in the picture. Let's begin with the early years, the beginning years. When two become one, we'll read verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 127 again. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman watch but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Building a house. Oh, I remember when my wife and I were building a home, and by building a home, we've never actually built a house. But we worked to build a home. Man, those early years starting out, they're frightening, aren't they? Amen. They're even more frightening when you think about the number of people that are not doing it in God's way. Amen. Except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain to build it. Now, my grandparents, we, their names were Bill and Evelyn, but they didn't want to be called uh, grandfather and grandmother, so we called them Bill and Nanny. I guess there were a couple of little Bills. But <laughs> during their lifetime together, they moved a good deal, and they built several houses. They built seven or eight houses. I never can't remember the number. Half the family can't either. But they built several houses. Now, when I say Bill and Danny built several houses, do you picture in your mind uh, two people, a man and a woman, holding hammers and driving all the nails? Or do you have in your mind they built the houses because they contracted it, they laid out the blueprint, they decided where they wanted it to be, how they wanted it to be done? They built the houses because they said, we're going to have a house right here. They made sure it got done. Except the Lord built the house. Is God building your house? Is it based on his design, his blueprint? Is it where he wants it to be, the way he wants it to be? Friends, if God's in the picture, then the godly home has God as its designer. Yes, the home has a design. We might even say it has a definition, and it's not the one that American people and Christians have been force-fed over the last few years. The home is to be built God's way. Yes. Those scribes came to Jesus. They said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause? Yeah. I guess they had some that were burning dinner. I don't know. <laughs> Can a man put away his wife for any cause? Jesus said, have you not read 
Matthew 19, 4, that he which made them at the beginning, ah, Jesus didn't take them to the law per se. He didn't take them to the Ten Commandments or all of the legislative principles contained in Exodus. He took them back to the beginning. Amen. Have you not read that he which made them creation, design, he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female. And said, For this call shall man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore there are no more twain but one flesh. Well, therefore, God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God designed it. Yes. God uses it, joins it together. It's God in the picture when my home comes together. Sorry, bro. We're, we're, we're being told that a marriage can be him and her, or her and her, or him and him. Now, we want to keep this respectful. Because some of the people that actually believe that this is right need reach, and they're not going to reach if they become treated like they're a mockery. But at the same time, we need to be willing to call sin sin. Yes, sir. Right. Friends, these souls need to know that they're entering a warped, perverted form of God's pure institution. Amen. Therefore, it's not God's institution. Because when you pervert what God gave, it's not what God gave anymore. Amen. When we look at the home, do we appreciate the way God designed it? Now, Christians, we generally speaking, and, and listen, sadly enough, there are times when when I want to meet my bald head against some bricks because there are times when Christians don't even accept these bricks that we just described. Amen. But if I beat my bald head against bricks, I'm ugly than I am now. Now, we, typically speaking, understand this idea of him and her, the two become one. And it is to last forever, till death do us part. That's what we say. But in America, the divorce rate is, we're told, around 50%. There are those that want to argue. They say, no, the divorce rate's not that high. It's at 30%. Oh, that's a lot better. So that means that only three out of every 10 couples that say, till death do us part, say, oh, no, I have my fingers crossed. <laughs> divorce isn't fun. Yeah, and not right. everyone who is involved in such is uh, complicit or responsible for it having happened. But a marriage takes two. Yeah. And if your spouse goes nuts and then completely out of your control, but a marriage takes two. Amen. That being said, we look at the society around us and marriage is a joke. It's a punchline. Yeah. It's something conformable, amenable, <coughs> pervertible. Are we holding to God's definition of it, friends? Sorry. Not only in terms of who's eligible, mm -hmm. but in terms of the proper order. Therefore shall man leave father and mother. Boy, grow up and be able to stand on your own. Amen. If, if I got to go get married, and as soon as we leave the chapel, we head back to mom and daddy's because I, I'm not even able to do an apartment. So, something's not quite right there. Therefore shall man leave father and mother. God wants me to be able to be responsible. Amen. Leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, then they come together. Oh, by the way, she needs to be responsible enough, too, that when, when they're joined together, that the authority over her is now her husband, and she's not going back to daddy, or God forbid, going back to mama, who was in charge of her house anyway. <laughs> Leave father and mother. Leave to his wife. And then they become the physical infants. Now, Christians, we... We recognize and oppose the perversion of the eligible participants in marriage. But are we becoming complacent with those who are shacking up? All right. Are we becoming complacent when we find out, you know, Tom and Gene, they, they were dating, but they realized they just weren't sexually compatible, so they broke up. Repeat that again, brother. I know I can. <laughs> Friends, are we are we becoming complacent in the areas where the world has desensitized us? 
But we're still up in arms over these areas that are new. If so, how are we going to feel about these new patterns that are emerging in 20 years? Are we going to be looking at them the same way that we look at this, this couple that's just living together? If it's going to have God in the picture, He's got to be the designer. We've got to go by His blueprint. And not only does He need to be the designer, friends, now please understand, and, and, and we need to teach our children this, and I'm going to repeat this today. Intimacy is a beautiful thing. We need to be teaching our children that from an early age. Marital intimacy is a beautiful thing. Behold, marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled, Hebrews 13, 4. There's nothing dirty about intimacy in marriage. Amen. But I've heard of young women that maintained their purity, got married, and then felt guilty on their honeymoon because they still saw this intimacy as something dirty. I'm here to tell you, I feel sorry for that little groom. It's a beautiful and we need to be teaching our children that. We don't need to be afraid of the word sex. But we need to make sure we put it in its proper context. Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled. But foremongers and adulterers, God will judge. What's dirty about it is when it's not done God's way. Amen. Is God in the picture? Is he the designer of my home? And is he the defender of it? Verse 127, verse 1, the latter part of the verse. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman watch it, but in vain. Now, we want the Lord to protect our nation, right? I do. I want the Lord to protect my city. I, I, I'm here to tell you, whenever whenever a fly bats its wings too hard in the Gulf of Mexico, we have to pray for a storm not to come near New Orleans. That's just the way it is. We pray for our city. Or you might say our bowl. You get the idea. We also pray for the homes in our city. Now, if I pray for the homes plural, should I not be praying for the home individual for God's protection for? Right. Am I asking God to defend what he calls indefensible? Hmm. Am I spending my conversation, my time, my energy, my vote, my money, am I spending who I am trying to defend what God says is not acceptable? All right. Amen. I know a Gamaliel. He, he was a Pharisee. And he stood up and said, brethren, let these men alone. Because if it's a man, what they're teaching will come to naught. But be careful, lest, lest you, if it be a God, you won't overcome it, lest you be found to fight against God. I don't ever want to be found to fight against God. And God has already plainly declared where he stands on this issue of what a home is, what a marriage is. Is God defending what I see as a home? Or am I trying to alter God's definition of it? Uh, if God's in the picture, then my home has God as the designer. And it has God as its defense. Now let's understand something. Another problem we have in our society today is that 43% of the children born are born to mothers that aren't married. Yes, sir. And that varies with demographics. But when we back up and look at our nation as a whole, 43%. That's almost half of the children born are born illegitimate. Sometimes it's because she made a mistake. They made a mistake. Oh, the boy, just listen to she, please. And I'm not coming down on just one here. So often is the case, they engage in the act, he hit the highway, she has a child. She can't go back in time. She can't change that. That might be your home right now. I know. I know some Christians, faithful young ladies who weren't faithful in the past. And so they're, they're bringing up children because they weren't faithful in the past and they're not married. Do you realize that when I repent, when I make things right with God, and I move forward doing that which is righteous, God has designed my own. Now, if I keep on moving forward doing that which is unrighteous, guess which designer I'm following? Pardon my language, English teachers, but it ain't God. Now, 
The godly house has God as its designer, as its defense, and as its desire. Verse 2 of Psalm 127. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Gentlemen, have any of you ever been called a workaholic? No. <laughs> it's vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to overwork yourself. For what? For what? Ecclesiastes 6, 7, uh, the point is made that uh, the man that is, is just working is just eating for his own mouth. Right. Proverbs 16, 26, he that laboreth, keeps on laboring, continuous laboring, incessant laboring, a workaholic, he that laboreth, laboreth for himself because his mouth desires it. Right. Now, we're to take care of our families. A man that will not take care of his own, especially if his own house, he's denied the faith, he's forced into the infidel, 1 Timothy 5, 8. But how many men are telling themselves, well, I'm just working to take care of the family. I'm working to take care of the family, but my family needs that four car. My family needs that 8,000 square foot house. My family needs that pool in the backyard. My family needs that fill in the blank. My family needs all this material stuff, but they don't need to see my face. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. God gives his beloved sleep. God's going to take care of you. Amen. Now, gentlemen, yes, there are those that would take this to the wrong extreme and say, See, I don't need to work. <laughs> if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he can deny the faith and is worse than an infidel. And we don't have to start naming names, do we? Every one of you already has somebody in your head. <laughs> Friends, Man. gentlemen, men are worse about this than women. Now, women, women, women will be guilty, but men are more prone to overwork themselves. And we tell ourselves, I'm doing it for my family, I'm doing it for my family, but what is that? They're marching to Jerusalem. And I cannot help but wonder if this inspired psalm was also reflected in the sage wisdom of the older men that were marching with the younger men. Watch how much you're working. It's vain for you to rise up early to sit up late. All you're doing is running yourself in the ground. I've known people that work this much, that distance themselves from their families because of all the effort they put into their job and not their home. And guess how many children they have at home right now? 